the Lovegoods, Weasleys, and Longbottoms are invited to the official swearing-in of Grindelwald as Minister of Magic. They are all pretending interest in becoming Aurors, and the elitist new minister wants to show them off as young, up-and-coming, full-blood supporters. They are placed in an overflow observation room containing a large magic mirror in the far wall, so as to be able to watch the swearing end of Grindelwald before taking their multi-hour long tour. This room contains a side wall that with the right word reveals an opening into the Auror Library for long ago wizards to be able to make video calls about library topics. Longbottom has a cheat journal of his ancestor with all the original Auror word spells written down. The young wizards came looking for definitive ancient evidence that the origin of magic lies not within humans, but within the magical creatures and plants they attend, meaning anyone can be magical if exposed to the right substances. They do indeed quickly find what they are looking for. In the most ancient bookshelf, Gweldig Morglod, the first High Merlin over the castle piece of Holyhead Paravel, the real Stonehenge. He describes the events of the ancient Anglesey division of the United Kingdom, when the island was magically split over the debate whether magical creatures should be allowed to roam free or be wrangled by the populace into useful service. The book is placed on a narration pedestal, and it snaps open and begins projecting a flashback to how the giants and the dragons and all the smaller magical beasts were being utilized for a many-sided war over who was to be the new high spellmaster over the island. Merlin the Magnificent, the ancient wizard overlord and conqueror of Britannia, now bending with age, looked out from his high glass observation deck atop the mountain mega complex through the 360 degree magical zoom glass to where the factions each came to his castle complex with their armies to demand his decision on a successor. The four intended candidates, as selected by the masses to lead, step forward from their armies and stand separate from the warmongers. Hufflepuff with her retinue of Mandragora, Ravenclaw with her troop of golems and charm weavers, Godric with his armada of griffins and spell slingers, Salazar with his dispatch of Slytherins, giant green snakes. Each of the four cast their visage huge into the sky over the lake as Merlin calls their name and the faction behind them cheers and blows flames and spells into the night. Tonight is a celebration of a difficult new era of magic. We must look to the children. They are our hope. Step forward. The teens edge away from their families. To you. I give you my castle. There are magical murmurs of confusion and uncertainty from the masses. Too long we have held ourselves aloof. Muggles think only of their homes and businesses. They don't see what is all around them. But ruling them is an impossibility. We cannot conquer them. The magical throngs burst into dismayed resistance. The echo chamber crystal room heralds down to the waiting masses at the edge of the lake moat Merlin's command. Silencio. Human and magical animals' voices cut off, and even the dragons are rendered numb. None shall rule here. Merlin slams down his wooden staff, a branch from the tree of life, into the stone at the pinnacle front of the labyrinthine castle. He transforms into a conduit of energy that shoots from the clouds down into the earth and the entire island was split from the point of impact, upheaved and rendered down the middle, each as a section of his magical castle tears itself into four distinct pieces. 
as the four candidates each used their respective magically themed objects to shield the mass of wizards with protego. The faction creatures and sorcerers are torn away across many hundreds of miles distance. Each section becomes a new spot of preserved magic. The northernmost piece is the chunk known as Hogwarts. The heads of the four factions teach the youth there, in a time-honored tradition to this day. The modern wizard teens are led to believe they can find real physical proof at this castle built by giants that could convince maybe even Grindelwald himself to invest in their end goal of reintroducing muggles to the wizarding world in stages before all the wizard lines die off. The Death Eaters get into the library through a huge urn in a library alcove corner, which had a twin elsewhere for old magical incense communications. The Death Eaters cheat the spell as they are now made out of death magic and waft into the room into physical form quickly one after another. The teens hide behind a tapestry in their secret sitting room and watch the Death Eaters pace around, smelling for dark magic. While the freaks are looking for any especially destructive spell book, one of the teens sneezes and the Death Eaters quickly close in on the sound as black smoke and whip aside the tapestry to expose the supposedly plain brick wall. One of the Death Eaters waves her hand in front of her eyes, and is then looking through the stone right at them, and grins. But then there is a chime, and the criminals are scattered as silver light smashes into the bricks where they were just standing. The silver energy stems from first around, then out of a small door inset in the silver brick wall, as an elevator chimes, and the silver arrow atop the door quickly spins around and reaches the far right. The first of the Aurors to arrive, Harold Potter, summoned from Bolivia, smashes aside the little sliding door and rolls out into the hectic room, immediately screaming in disoriented pain, God damn fuck, what the fuck is going on in here? The ancient books the Death Eaters were wrangling get disturbed open and blast colored magical energy everywhere, as more chatter and smoke and wail and fall from the shelves, and dark wizards skid across long oaken tables as their smoking forms attempt to re-solidify and run for it, towards more portal doors that have magical bars slamming down into position. More silver flashes erupt from several other silver wall elevators, signaling more aurors arriving, as each footfall sounds like anvils, triple wrapped in burlap, falling to the floor as Harold strides forward, somehow each step taking him as many yards. He flings several aggressive books his way back onto their shelves, with motions from his hands as he steps past. He grabs at several half-condensed forms as they splat through more barred portal doors, as they try to rip free and teleport away anyways, but he pulls with a magical bellow of muscular strain and flings the last two freaks back into the room. You've been listening to a narration of a script work narrated written by Amon Pro Life. He's a pro at life. Trademark, copyright, all rights restricted, penises erected, muscles flected. So this is how Harold Trotter should come into the room right through the small door. You know, like, comes into it like this, you know? And then he's all like, you know, he like folds up out of it and then he's all like, you know, runs out to them because he's all, you know, got a heavy footfall, so he's all like... Yeah, it's perfect. Because <laughs> you, you weigh so much, you know. <laughs> this floor is just shit. Yeah, it is. I didn't want to write forever, so when it comes to the um, Merlin beginning opener for the next Fantastic Beast movie... I 
went light and skimmed through like other authors do. I can do it in a lot more detail and still keep that epic feeling. But just for expedience, I'll describe a few things. Um, I noticed since the 90s, everyone's been obsessed with this Harry Potter thing that I haven't even brought up yet. I don't, I don't think anybody else has written this um, where when the castle of Merlin at the center of the island is being split into pieces... The um, teenagers have broomsticks and they've flown to a separate section around the castle because he asked them to, you know, as part of the uh, ceremony. Because that's how everybody acts anyways. Like, the younger people have to watch because they're not supposed to be involved with the politics and all of that. So then in revenge, he, with his explosion of let's call it life magic that's so ran out of positive charge it's like it's death magic it's the reverse and um my concept is here merlin will return later on at the end of fantastic beasts as a culmination not fully of course because You know, that wouldn't make sense, but, you know, we need more Merlin in there, of course. And so there's that whole scene everyone always paints in the moment where the castle's all breaking apart and all of the uh, other wizards are trying to disapparate and it's not working and they realize he's there once again completely at his mercy, Merlin. Then the teenagers have their broomsticks and it's like his gift to them. Like, he doesn't give a shit if anybody else lives or dies. So they're flying around while like whole chunks of electrified bits of like the outer grounds of the castle, the different side buildings and stuff are like floating up in chunks like electrically and like moving around as like the entire island splitting apart. And it really inspires a lot of uh, people on LSD to make artwork of it. It's really beautiful. I've seen a lot of artwork and I'm just describing it now in full recognition of it somehow through time. Um, I want Merlin to be really impactful in a lot of different ways. I want it to spawn good video games that everybody plays competitively and fairly without cheating anymore. That's my other goal as well. We need a, um, game that's like, um, League of Legends, those type of games. That's more complex, four lanes, four teams, whatever. Like I described the four houses of, uh... Hogwarts and all of that. It's very important we uh, get this right and uh, make it appealing for a whole generation of people, you know? We gotta keep going with this. Alright, Mr. Private Investigator, who's, uh, you know, in the Harold... Trotter universe? Trotter universe. Of Fantastic Beasts. (laughs) Yeah, it's hard to say that, I don't know why. Um, So he needs to smoke one of those, you know, Cuban's finest, where... It's uh, mostly weed, right? And the very core is maybe like concentrated weed, hashish or whatever. And then the exterior is wrapped in tobacco leaves, you know, as for the cover. And then he smokes it and he does different magic things with it. Like, for example, he's a private investigator. So he uh, has it go under doors and it goes and it unlocks doors. You know, it turns into like a hand and then opens things. Um... He can also spy with it, like, you know... Like, it'll pull up against yeah. a windowsill that he's blowing it uh, upward and, toward. Yeah. and create a, a refraction mirror down at him, like, like, casting of what he's looking at, for example. Out of the weed crystals. Then, of course, when, once again, when the Death Eaters are around and doing their death floaty blackness, then he can beat the shit out of them with his cigar smoke. Ironically, you know, and yeah. bind them with chains and stuff formed out of smoke temporarily and stuff. And then shoot him with his Thompson submachine gun. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I was thinking, um, in order for people to be able to fight the Death Eaters, um, and not themselves be Death Eaters, they need to instead be attacking them with light magic, color, sparkles, all that crap. Because this is a kind of gay series of Harry Potter. So um, I was thinking 
we'd have the younger characters come across a spell from ancient wizards, maybe Merlin himself, a page from his book they find somewhere. And it allows you to grow wings like a Patronus, but out of the energy of your body so you can fly. And um, the wings look various ways depending upon who you are. So if you're a gay sparkle fairy at heart, then you're going to have gay butterfly wings in the series. Um, that's just what we're doing because uh, we're having movies represent who people are to make easy content. And content that they believe in that they want to express to the masses. It's not propaganda. It's just who they are and they get to be free about that. Whatever direction that is, I suppose, as long as they're not trying to murder anyone. <laughs> See, what I would explain here is Sirius Black was already dead, which is why Harry Potter was acting so weird about it in the book series. Because Azkaban is a place where they bring them where the water meets the cliffs in a certain way, where it's supposed to keep the dead spirits through the water's flow held down. They try to horcrux themselves or use magic of different side types to keep coming back from the dead to be, you know, wizards on the loose in different ways. And so Sirius Black, as we know, through the Harry Potter series, had good intentions, but he was still using dark magic to do it. So he was, that, that's all. He was alive, though, in a certain way instead of being dead, which is why he escaped, which is the explanation, like my brother said. They only thought he was dead because in the world of uh, wizards, everybody pretends like they know things when they know nothing. And so, as such, that's why his character was so motivational, because he wants revenge. Anyways, um, yeah, so the Death Eaters escape from Azkaban, and that's the start of this rise of uh, he who must not be named, Tom Riddle. Is that they slowly corrupt the world until Tom Riddle can join with them in the future of this plot series eventually and become, you know, who he is. Because he can't do it by himself. It's through all of the Death Eaters escaping from Azkaban. They're, they are the ones that work for him. Well, yeah, we can have Tom Riddle um, interacting with, I suppose, the Weasley parents when they were younger. Like, I have it coming in like they're whatever age, 15 to 18, um, in the script I wrote. So they could interact with Tom Marvolo Riddle, whether he's around their age, younger, or older, whatever. And I don't have any details yet. That's just a thought. Yeah, and I'll repeat this one thing because Harry Potter's established it. Tom Marvolo Riddle is not a redeemable character and isn't misunderstood and we're not misinterpreting. He's not some gore the destroyer like there's even one aspect of something that makes you feel like at least... You know, because he doesn't want to die is the point I'm trying to make here. There's no part of him that wants any peace. He's pure bad. So anyways, to further elaborate on what I was saying, I was just going to say that Grindelwald is proven to have created a Patronus out of the creature that he killed because what they didn't show in the other movie is that he ate the creature because it's fucking Hannibal Lecter, baby, playing the role. And so his base philosophy is, you know, that you consume the animals and cook them perfectly with herbs and things they like. And then you're creating a new world and life for them inside of your body by living a better life. It's the Native American philosophy. So he's being sworn in as minister of magic or whatever you're saying, uh, the head of the Aurors, because regardless of people's opinion he has infinite supporters and he's proven to have later like they keep repeating throughout the movie so it can't be removed everywhere as part of the plot he uses his patronus and they always mention it everywhere and everybody says it and it is the the weird stag creature that you know he ate he brought it back to life with his own energy and once it's far enough away from him it always dies and returns to him which is why it died in the scene the end He's got business interests. Nah, he's American. So, um, Jack Nicholson, I was just talking about it. And um, because everybody else is losing a lot of the water retention and painful weight around their abdomen, 
uh, hopefully at least for these next films. Hopefully it won't be digital because that would be saddening. It's always good to see people, you know, returning to a state of health and realizing that they have much longer uh, life spans than they think they do. I guess that's what I would say overall. Because everybody's in denial and kills themselves off. So Jack Nicholson, you know, like, he could lose enough weight to at least be, you know, sort of trim in the, in the abdomen region and then be an American retired, like, wizard. It's like the joke is he's like one of those investigators, like the, the, the joke of how everybody acts like American investigation shows go. Like, he shows up with, like, a Panama hat on, smoking, like, you know two cigarettes in either mouth for side for no reason because like I don't know why except they're not cigarettes I only I do not promote cigarette smoking and I never will so I always insist that everybody smoke spliffs in my films if they you know they care about what the writer has to say about the characters so he shows up he's you know smoking a huge shitload you have the excuse that he's slow even within his character because I like my characters to be cool because he's injured from some previous fights. So, you know, he sort of limps around slowly and then he whips out, you know, under his leather duster, a giant Thompson submachine gun to advance the plot. And I always say that actors should be doing this to advance the plot because whenever the plot slows down and somebody's just talking for no reason, you need somebody to advance the plot. So, Jack Nicholson, please, baby, be in Harry Potter, and fuck the British people that say that guns that are ensorcelled with giant, like, you know, hunting dogs and glowy, like, you know, rivers running across them can't glow, light up, and fire bullets. Because how you could use your wand to ensorcel these bullets over time, and they can have an expiration date and go bad in six months, you know? It's just the amount of time and care that you put into anything in life, kind of like a movie.